The time has finally come. Chris and I will sit down and discuss Shang-Chi and the Ten Legend of the Ten Rings. Can we find ten reasons to love this movie? The byword starts now. Ladies and gentle people, welcome back to another episode of the Nerd Byword Podcast, the best podcast around for nerds. There, I said it, it's the truth. In this episode, we are finally going to sit down and discuss uh, the newest MCU entry, Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. What did we think of the movie? As always, we're going to be tackling our likes and dislikes. But before we hit the big talk, it is, as always, time for... Chris, what's shaking in the world of news? Well, it looks like Disney Plus is just adding a couple more Infinity Stones to its arsenal. Um, looks like uh, Catherine Hahn is getting her own Agatha Harkness series uh, that is spinning off. Uh, WandaVision head writer Jack Schaefer would serve as the writer and executive producer. This is in the very early stages. Um very exciting. Uh, I, I think that Catherine Hahn was one of the strengths of that series. Um, you know, not all that surprising uh, that it was Agatha all along, but it did produce one of the biggest earworms of the last year. Um, and then in an additional report, it looks like um, the stars may be aligning and I'm going to have to flip on manifest mode again because it looks like Tiana Paris could be getting her own Monica Rambo Disney Plus series. Now, this is just a rumor uh, from Daniel RPK, but oh my God, if we get a Disney Plus series of Monica Rambo, I'll just die of happiness. And we're getting uh, Black Canary already. So, I mean, Disney knows that they've got a good thing and they're being smart with this, like just cranking out popular characters with their own series. So I'm super excited for this and I hope that all the rumors are true, as Lizzo would say. Yeah, see, I'm very curious about this in a number of ways. I'm very curious to see what the plot would be of an Agatha Harkness uh, Disney Plus series. Would it be uh, a prequel uh, to what we saw in WandaVision? Would it be a sequel where she breaks free from whatever, you know, Wanda did to her at the end uh, of that series? Um, And, you know, are we going to delve more into her background, her motivation? Like, what exactly are we looking at here? Um, A lot of questions to be answered. Now, Uh, having uh, Monica Rambeau getting her own Disney Plus series would be absolutely fascinating. Given the timeline, I would be assuming that this would be uh, as a sequel to the Marvels, perhaps. Uh, So it's very difficult to predict what this show would actually be about, sort of broad strokes-wise, since we do not know what Monica Rambeau's status is going to be after that movie. So a lot of question marks here. Um, but the you know out of the two rumors, I think I've seen the Agatha Harkness thing um, reported much more. Uh, so that seems, I would say, almost like a safe bet at this point. Uh, one way or another, Disney Plus has been producing some interesting stuff, Chris. So I'm I'm looking forward to seeing what they do with these characters. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm very happy with uh, the bang for my buck on my subscription. I just finished What If, and that was really ambitious and fun. Um, the animation was a little hit or miss for me, but uh, it was a lot of fun and, and seeing the a lot of the characters come back. Lake Bell, here's my hot take of the week. Lake Bell, who famously does an incredible job as Poison Ivy in the Harley Quinn animated series, is an incredible Natasha Romanoff. Uh, love her in that role. Um, and then, uh, you know, I've still got Star Wars Visions on my docket, and I've heard nothing but great things for that. And then you add two series like this. As far as what are we going to do with the Agatha thing, I, I, I've bounced around a couple ideas, seen a lot of stuff speculated on the internet. I was incredibly intrigued with, like, the the flashback to uh, Salem, Massachusetts in that one scene of, like, the next to last episode, possibly the last episode, I can't remember. But I was super intrigued by that. Also, there's a lot of speculation uh, comic fans know that Agatha Harkness was the nanny and, you know, rearer of Franklin Richards, who, um, before Dan Slott did what he did, uh, no comment, 
uh, was one of the most powerful mutants in the entire Marvel universe. And so a lot of connections to the fantastic four, which, you know, is coming up as well. So lots of speculation running rampant. Um, I'm just super excited for the MCU content we're getting. The Marvels is one of my most anticipated, um, your most anticipated, your girl Kamala Khan, uh, my girl Monica Rambo. Like it, we're we're eating good, Dave. We're feasting. Yeah, I would say so. All right. Um, speaking of your girl, uh, Sabrina's back. Praise Satan. <laughs> uh, look, look, man, I don't know what to say to this particular story. So um, as longtime listeners know, I'm a huge fan of Netflix's Chilling Adventures of Sabrina. Um, I, I thought it was a, a perfectly um, infused horror series with great acting, great writing, a uh, wonderful atmosphere. And the show regrettably only ran for two seasons, split each into two parts. So we got four sort of mini seasons, basically, of the show before it was canceled. And spoiler alert, the series ended with Sabrina Spellman sacrificing herself and dying. So, you know, a, a certain amount of closure, I guess, but still, um, you know, I feel like in a lot of ways, this was a, a missed opportunity. I think there was a lot more storytelling uh, to be done there with that character. And Kiernan Shipka's performance of Sabrina Spellman was absolutely spellbinding, absolutely loved it. Uh, a show that I have very little um, patience for, but is uh, produced by the same team is the CW's Riverdale, which to me, uh, in my few attempts watching it, represents in a lot of ways some of the very worst CW tendencies of like this absolutely weird teenage drama that goes so far over the top it reaches almost parody levels. So I've been avoiding that particular show like the plague, and now it appears like I am going to actually have to grind my teeth, sit down, and watch an episode of Riverdale. And I don't know if I can stand it. But uh, so there was um, a writer from Riverdale, Evan Kyle, was doing a Q&A on the dip uh, after the season five finale of Riverdale and confirmed that uh, Sabrina Spellman is coming to Riverdale uh, in season six, episode four, uh, a uh, episode entitled The Witching Hours. Um, we're going to get... Uh, Kieran Shipka back in her role. Uh, There's not a whole lot known about the episode. The only thing we know is that uh, one of the characters from Riverdale, Cheryl Blossom, whoever in the world that might be, is going to get involved with some dark magic and Sabrina is going to show up to help her in some way. Now, how they're going to explain this one, considering that the character is, is dead in her own show, uh, I have no idea. Maybe this is, you know, uh, set before the finale of Sabrina. Uh, maybe we're getting her, you know, out of the afterlife. After all, uh, th- that would be a positive, I think. I still maintain some kind of hope we might get a revival at some point, a movie or something from Netflix, because canceling the show was an injustice against humanity. <laughs> so, you know... <laughs> Good news, you know, Sabrina Spellman is coming back. Bad news, I have to watch Riverdale to actually see that character in action again. So, uh, decidedly mixed back, Chris. Yeah, it's really, uh, it's really inexcusable that I haven't taken the dip to to watch the Chilling Adventures of Sabrina. I was a huge fan of the the show back in the day, um, the Melissa Joan Hart series. Okay, let's let's be real. Uh, I was a huge fan of Salem. Uh, voiced by Nick Bakai, who was an absolute scene stealer. Uh, and then Kiernan Shipka, like, oh my God, what a tour de force actress that that woman is. I mean, um, watching her grow up right before our very eyes on uh, Mad Men as Sally Draper, even though she, you know, needed to be grounded or some s- sincere punishment the way that she acted most of the time, but a huge fan of her portrayal in that series. Um and then you add to the fact that Miguel uh, Aguirre Sacasa is is the showrunner of that, and one of my favorite comic book writers, one of the most underrated comic book writers. With you know, I sang his praises on the Night Cra- uh, Nightcrawler solo, Sensational Spider Man run. Uh, yeah, it's time for me to 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 click the play button on that, even though I'm already upset that you know it was prematurely canceled. Yeah, premature cancellation seems to be a theme in our lives, Chris. All right, folks. Well, that's it for Nerd News. Stick around. After a short break, we will be back with our big talk, where we'll we'll be talking about Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. Stick around. (laughs) 
All right, ladies and gentle people, welcome back. It's time for the one we've been waiting for for a couple of weeks now. It's time for our... And of course, this week we are finally talking about Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. Now, we've made a habit, Chris, of trying to review uh, some of these newer movies as they come out. But I will freely admit this was my fault. I was a little delayed in being able to watch the movie. So now that I finally watched it, we can sit down and actually have a good conversation about this. As always, when we uh, review a movie, we each have found three things we really liked and three things we uh, really disliked about the movie. And then we're going to present our final verdict. So, Chris, if you can kick us off with your first like of the movie. Well, I think this is um, probably one of my favorite um, MCU adversaries. I don't I don't know that it rises to villain. Um, but Wenwu is is just absolutely captivating and mesmerizing in, in this uh film. And Tony Leung, I mean, delivers like it is insane what he brings to this uh, brings to the screen here and like the complicated like muckiness of this entire relationship of like, you know, so I'm not as well versed as I'd like to be in Shang-Chi comics. So, you know, from what I understand, it's a pretty stereotypical like dad is a crime lord and all this. But like, this is so much more than that. This is a much more nuanced storyline. It's so well written. There's nuance to um, their relationship and like what he wants for them. It is not this like, you know, my dad's the kingpin or something like that. It's truly like I want the best for my children and, you know, while I'm flawed, you know, like so as a father, like I could I could see, you know, it's not necessarily the approach that I would take with my children. But like you could you could relate like watching this as a father is a different experience that I would have watched, you know, you know, in my 20s or something like that. Um, But also it was just like such crisp smart writing with you know the cultural appropriation bit i i'm immediately thinking of at the dinner table when they're talking about the name of the mandarin and like just how they laugh it all off and how hilarious it is and i i just loved everything about that character um even his motivations is he truly believes that he is and this is full spoilers. If you haven't watched Shang-Chi, why in the world are you listening to a reaction podcast episode on Shang-Chi? But we, he truly believes that his wife is behind this wall in Ta Lo and in, 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 is immediately as he sees that he's been duped and he's been tricked, it is immediate. And so like you see these motivations and 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 so many cases not just the MCU but villains in in comic book movies at large like they really lack that motivation and really lack any kind of relatability so you can kind of see where they're coming from and it's just believable it's just usually just like starch cardboard type stuff but like you really relate with this guy and i absolutely loved everything about the character the portrayal all of it yeah, talk about a character getting, you know, an upgrade. Uh, we move from this, basically this racist stereotype and caricature in the Mandarin from the comic books to, you know, a, a complex, interesting character with a dark side and, and also a lot of love for his wife and his family. Um, yeah, I absolutely love this character. And I think this is probably one of the best changes uh, that the MCU has made uh, as far as a villain goes. I think um, there was a lot of disappointment when Iron Man 3 came out, and that's the kind of direction they decided to take with the Mandarin, this whole, you know, actor that was hired. And, you know, once again, we have this businessman rival of of Tony Stark be the real villain. But what they did here, I think, with the Mandarin character uh, is they created a kind of complexity uh, and a character that you actually really are interested in. And in some moments, even root for. I mean, there are moments, especially when, you know, his his wife is killed, where it's difficult to find fault in his, him getting, um, le- letting his anger sort of take over, you know? So I, I would say this is by far the best MCU upgrade 
uh, in an adaptation of a character that we have seen. The changes were all spot on. This is a great, great character, which I think in a lot of ways made, you know, his ultimate fate in the movie that much more disappointing because I think here's a character that we could have seen more of in the future. I think there was still stuff to mine there. I totally, totally agree with everything that you said. Although I would, I would, um, I like to present the case of Mbaku as like right up there with the same level of super racist trope from the comics, even though it may not have been ill intentioned. Like, I I think what they did with that character, or what Ryan Coogler did with that character and company, uh, is just absolutely the upgrade that it needed. In in so much that now the character of Mbaku in the comics is written by Tanahasi Coates is is a, like a reflection of that character and it's all for the better so everybody wins and and i think that is the direct result of having people in the room writing the character that are of that you know um ethnicity or of that origin national origin so when you have black people writing black characters like mbaku or when you have people of asian descent writing asian characters like wen wu i think it is like duh you know so um i think it's a much much needed um upgrade and like it, it just feels right and it feels authentic and i was i was a little bit peeved that he was killed off uh cuz i wanted to see more of that but at the same time like i see the you know the sacrifice it's like the crescendo of his story yeah absolutely all right, Dave, what is uh, your first like? Because I, I I want to rant about how much I love this as well. Yeah, I absolutely uh, am a sucker for martial arts movies. And I have a horrible tendency to watch, you know, the a collection of the most poorly dubbed uh, movies uh, from various Asian countries. I mean, absolutely just atrociously dubbed when I was a child, just so I could see all this martial arts action. Um I'm a big, big fan of martial arts movies. And seeing that martial arts was represented really, really well in this movie made me happy. Uh, I really enjoyed a lot of the action scenes. The scene on the bus in particular, for the fact that it came so early in the movie, I think is really a standout action scene to me. Uh, There was a lot of fun in that scene, and it just really worked. All the pieces just fit together perfectly. I will say that I was a little disappointed that in some parts the 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 lighting and the camera work kind of muddled being able to really enjoy uh some of these martial arts scenes. I think the the camera later on in the in the sort of latter half of the movie got a little bit of ADHD going on. It's kind of just all over the place. Um kind of lingering and taking, you know, a little bit of time to really showcase the martial arts I think would have been better because let me tell you everybody involved in this movie that worked on the stunt work uh, deserves an A plus. Like this was fantastic stuff. I really, really loved uh, the martial arts and it's a perfect flavor for, for a a MCU movie because one thing we have not had a lot of is real sincere, well choreographed martial arts. So this, this was really, really a lot of fun for me. Yeah. I immediately like want to go binge like all the old school Kung Fu stuff, all the Jackie Chan, all the Chow Yun Fat stuff. Like it's, it's just fun and it's so well choreographed. Like it's like a dance. I'm telling you, Dave, I was, I had tears in my eyes watching that opening scene of Ta Lo and like, um, you know, the, the, the choreography on that opening fight with Wen Wu and, and Shang-Chi's mother, um, it, it was immediately reminiscent of Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. And like, just it's, it's like a symphony of it. It's just so poetic and I could go on forever. Like, it's just so well done. Like that entire team of the choreographers, the stunt crew, everybody needs to be up for Academy Awards because it is beautifully done. Yeah, I, I absolutely loved it, Chris. All right, what is your second like of uh, Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings, Chris? So you know me, I'm a big language, culture, history, mythology nerd, and I loved all of this, the the love letters to Asian culture and history and mythology, which, you know, I have no direct connection to, you know, genetically speaking, but I love celebrating other cultures. And it's fascinating to me watching how other people live 
Like, what's their story? What have they been talking about for the last 500,000, 2,000 years? Like, so looking at the differences of, you know, Norse mythology, Egyptian mythology, you know, Sub-Saharan African mythology, Asian mythology, to explain, you know, tale uh, creation stories and, and things like that of like, and, and so like down to like the mystical creatures that were in Talo it was just such a beautiful thing. Um, you know, the Jincharaki of, you know, the nine tailed fox, like I absolutely loved uh, the, the, the Chinese lions uh, loved everything about it. And so it was just, I, th- I think, you know, from the outside looking in as a boring old white guy, like, from what I from what I understand, from what my black friends and family members experienced with with Black Panther, it was a celebration of their culture, their history, and their community. And this seems like it was along the same lines for for uh, the Asian diaspora. And I was so happy to see that. I was so happy to see um, all those people get a chance to just celebrate and be proud of their heritage. And it was just so cool to watch all of that unfold. Yeah, you know, uh, I've like I said before, I, I have a tendency of watching a lot of foreign films. You know, thank God for subtitles because the dub work on a lot of those, especially older movies, is absolutely atrocious. Um, so I, I, I really, especially in the martial arts genre, but even beyond that, I'm just a big fan of of films that come from the Asian market. And so seeing particularly uh, Chinese culture represented in a, a big blockbuster like this is, is you know pretty much out of the ordinary um i mean the most that you get is you know something like uh oh uh rush hour for example where you have you know jackie chan and you kind of just transplant him into this very tropey sort of american setting rather than allowing you know that actor to to bring along you know their culture and their storytelling methods uh, once it's transplanted into Hollywood, it all sorts of gets sort of gets diluted, and that's not to say that Shang Chi is not diluted too. It still has, you know, that uh, especially in the second half, it goes a little classical MCU tropey, and and there are things that are clearly diluted because of Hollywood. But um, I think this is more of a willingness in Hollywood to embrace a little bit of that kind of storytelling than I've seen in a good long while, and I'm I'm very pleased to see that. All right, Dave. I mean, we're we're like reading each other's scripts. It's like uh like I had premonitions about all this. So your second big like is I'm I'm championing as well. I'm all about Wong, okay? I love Wong in in Doctor Strange. I I think he is just one of the best supporting characters that the MCU has produced so far. Um, There is just something about this constantly exasperated guy who has to put up with everybody else's crap. Um, I just, I I can relate. I can relate a lot. (laughs) Yeah. So he's, he's a very relatable character, but he also has just a really cool vibe just as a character. He's extremely powerful. He's smart. Um, And anytime he pops up on the screen is always a blast. So seeing him in that fight club scene in particular is like the last place that you would, you know, picture finding Wong of all places. And then, you know, the, the mid credit scene where he pops up again and wants, you know, to have a talk with Shang-Chi about the whole Ten Ring situation. Uh, I really, really liked every second that that guy was on screen, which makes me look even more forward to, you know, Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. If they don't give Wong a prominent role in that movie, there is no justice in the world. That character is fantastic. Benedict Wong does a great job uh, actually, you know, portraying this character. Um, I'm just a big fan. And every second that Wong was on the screen in Shang-Chi was a scene stealer. Like he he just he just drew your attention immediately. So I was very, very pleased to see him in this movie. Yeah, I it's no secret that I'm a super fan of Benedict Wong's and you know he's perfect in this role, um, cleaning up uh all of Steven's nonsense. Like I still think back to that Spider-Man trailer where he's like Strange, don't cast that spell. <laughs> like he's like, I know, knowing that he's, it's exactly what he's going to do as long as, as soon as he walks through that portal. Um, yep. And then he's just, you know, there to clean up all the messes. He's the one gathering all the people in in uh, Endgame through through the portals, and like just that exasperated scene where he's like, "What you want more? <laughs> like, hey, got it. How much more do I have to do here?" Um, also. I, I've, it's been a previous nerd commendation, and there are some hits and misses with the series, but the Netflix Marco Polo uh, 
him as Kublai Khan is just one of the greatest acting performances I've ever, ever seen. So uh, I will watch anything that Benedict Wong is a part of and seeing him as like this integral role. He's like this kind of proto Nick Fury kind of recruiter now. Love that. Love that for him. Um, and, and I just can't wait to see more uh, of him on screen. Give me a give me a Wong Disney Plus series, doggone it. I, I would actually totally be into that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Chris, what is your third like? Uh, you know, preaching to the choir today, Dave. We love <laughs> women, and this movie is chock full of them. Um, so, I mean, like, take your pick. Uh, I mean, you've got uh, Shang-Chi's mother, Li, played by Fala Chen. Um, you've got Mengo Zhang as his sister, Sha Ling, who's just fascinating. And I want more and more and more and more and more of, uh, and then the deity herself, Michelle Yeoh as Ying Nan, like I, they're so strong and confident and they have this presence about them that without saying a word, without throwing a punch or a kick, like they own the room that they're in. I mean, like you have, the the scene where the the gang members or whatever come to their home when when Shang is little and his mother is standing there alone against all these gang members and she ultimately dies but like that last stand mentality of just her presence against all of these rough and rugged ruffians is just so powerful and inspirational and um I know we'll talk about Sha Ling specifically here in a little bit with some more but um I, I, I just need more and more and more and more of her. Yeah, I would say that, uh, you know, overall, they did a really, really good job with the women in this movie. I, I do have something to say a little bit later in the dislikes uh, about one particular situation. But uh, I will totally echo that. Anytime you get to have, you know, uh, women that kick butt, I'm all about that. I, I love strong female characters. So th this was re very, very cool, Chris. All right, Dave, let's finish up the likes category. You got one more. I think the whole movie to me works because of the family dynamic. I, I, you know, when you strip away all the, uh, you know, dragons and, and ten rings and supernatural stuff and martial arts, what you got here really is just a a, a story of a family. Um, you know, a deeply a deeply flawed father, a, a mother who dies too early, two kids who couldn't you know deal with the loss. Uh, the whole family sort of drifts apart. You know, th these are things that, that happen in the real world all too often. And because of that, there is a resonance in that movie. Just it, it feels true. It feels real. It feels honest. So I think that really is what makes Shang-Chi and the Ten Rings tick. It's not so much, you know, how awesome the martial arts is. It's not so much, you know, the guest spot of Wong. I think when it comes right down to it, it's the family dynamic. Is that when, when you gather this family around the dinner table you really care about that dynamic taking place. You know, that, that scene is almost as good as any martial arts scene in the movie. The verbal sparring between the family members alone is worth the price of admission here. Um, so keeping in mind that this is in a lot of ways a family drama while you're watching it, I think you get a lot more out of it even than just enjoying the fights and the special effects. Yeah, you took the words from my mouth. I would wager that you know, but this movie and any movie that is, you know, in a similar setting is the family dynamic is the foundation, the walls and the roof of the house. And then everything else is just, you know, interior decoration or paint on the walls. Um, you know, the martial arts is, you know, a nice love seat, you know, but like what what when you boil this movie down, strip it to its, you know, its essential ingredients of why it resonates with so many people, why it works on so many different levels is the same reason that we related to uh, black widow, like the, the strengths of that movie were the family dynamic and sign me up for a mealtime scene in any family dynamic movie like this, because those are the strengths. Those are the ones that I go back to personally of, you know, no matter what shape or size your family comes, whether it is, you know, covert Russian sleeper agents that aren't really related to one another or, you know, the complicated uh, history that you have here with this family. I mean, um, even I, I even go back to one of the first scenes in the movie with Katie's family um, and, you know, Shang, uh, you know, being kind of like adopted into that family, like come over here and get a bowl of food. 
just like those endearing little notes. The scenes don't have to be super long. It just kind of grounds it into that relatability. And I'm always here for a good mealtime scene. I'm also getting a little bit hungry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Chris. So this, uh, this is taking us now into the dislike category. So I'm, I'm very interested to see how we're going to spar here because I think you and I are going to have a couple of disagreements in this category. So what was your fair, first major dislike of Shang-Chi and the Ten Rings? So um, Aquafina as a whole is, is a problematic individual with, you know, the appropriation of, you know, African-American, you know, linguos and ebonics that she just uses. And then anytime she's asked about it, she dodges the question. Um, so I tried to divorce all preconceived notions. Um, and I, I, I thought I did a pretty good job of it. So, um, but for me, you know, whole kit and caboodle, I think the character of Katie was kind of bland and, um, a little archetypal, if you will. Like it's, it's, that's the, 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 the best friend who doesn't have any powers or whatever. Um, I did like that they did have this platonic friendship, um, a male female friendship that didn't have to be romantic at all. So that was the part that I did really enjoy about it. But the role of Katie really did not do a whole lot for me. Um, it's just kind of like a tag along type thing that didn't really add anything to the plot. But again, I did like the fact that their relationship was not automatically romantic. See, uh, this is one of the things that I think we uh, kind of disagree on because I didn't come into the movie knowing anything about Aquafina or anything about, you know, the problematic stuff she does as an individual. Um, and neither did my wife. And actually, my wife and I really enjoyed, particularly in the first half of the movie, the interplay uh, between Shang and Katie. I, there, there was something very interesting there that we really enjoyed. And yes, you hit the nail on the head, having a, a friendship between a male and a female character that doesn't devolve into, oh my gosh, they're in love, was actually very, very refreshing because that seems to be sort of the um, the default position of a lot of Hollywood movies anyways. But the other thing that I really liked about the character is that there was a little bit of an arc for her, actually. You know, those archetypical characters that are, like, on the sidelines and don't have powers, they don't really have, you know, as defined of an arc as Katie did. You know, the the whole, um, you know, directionless slacker at the start and then trying to, you know, find something that she can do to help as the story progresses and then the whole archery stuff. There was a, a arc there that I at least felt uh, was worthy of inclusion in the movie. Now, where they go with that character from here, because they very much seem to hint that wherever Shang goes next, Katie's going to follow, um, that that is a toss-up to me. But as far as this singular story, um, I thought it was perfectly fine. See, I, um, it, I see, I see what you're saying there, and I felt like and we'll talk about undercooked storylines in a second, but, but I think that one was, it fell a little bit flat for me. Like it was, it, it needed a little bit more. Like she learned archery in three days. Like that was a little hard. Um, I've been at the archery ranch. It's not that easy. Um, so just, it, it, it left a lot to be desired in my opinion. Fair enough. All right. What is, um, oh no. Oh no. I see your first dislike and we may have to disagree a little bit more. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah, I knew this was going to be a hot take. Um, I I I kind of feel like this movie is guilty of the sin of pretty much every superhero movie, and that is that they never take when they when they're innovating in the storytelling, they never take that story to its logical conclusion. Instead, they tack on some kind of you know CGI heavy you know, special effects as extravaganza, even if that is not where I think the story necessarily needed to go. And in this particular case, I'm just going to say it, we didn't need the dragons. Um, I, I think the entire climax of the movie, the big final fight was all unnecessary. W the way this movie has been structured and the way it was set up is it was set up as a confrontation between a family. And I think we kind of took the easy way out by having Wen Wu sacrifice himself, passing on the rings to his son, and so the son can, you know, kick dragon booty. Um, I don't think that's necessarily where this movie needed to end. Wen Wu is an incredibly complex character, for one, absolutely. And I feel like that ending just kind of brushed him aside. 
uh, and all that complexity really in favor of let's let's you know go ahead and fight some dragons to me the natural climax of this movie should have been a much longer more drawn out and more complex confrontation between Shang, between Wenwu, and between uh, Zha Ling, the sister. I think that is where the movie should have ultimately ended. And anything about dragons and all that stuff could have very easily be saved for a sequel. The problem, of course, is that this is an MCU movie and you need a big special effects extravaganza at the end. But having a smaller, more intimate climax focused on the family, which could have featured some absolutely stunning martial arts, would have been something incredibly different and a real risk for a Marvel movie. And I think it would have rang truer in the grand context of this movie just to end with a family confrontation and maybe a hint that we're going to have this whole dragon thing you know in a sequel that escalates a little bit um yeah you know that moment when when chang is like slowly taking over the 10 rings from his dad i thought that was absolutely genius and then you know that that gets dropped and suddenly the rings just go back to his dad and then his dad has to give them back to him as he's dying Whereas I think it, there is something incredibly climactic about the notion that Shang literally can take these rings, that he has, you know, achieved a level of, you know, mastery, that he can just slowly take them away from his father and strip him of his power. That was an inc- incredibly powerful moment that then immediately got reversed for a sacrifice scene so we can, you know, punch dragons. So I think it, the movie escalated too quickly, you know? Um you start with this great martial arts bus scene, and within two hours, suddenly we're riding dragons. You know, a, a little slower growth, save something for the sequel, I think would have been much smarter here. Plus, I just wanted a really intimate, you know, these, this family hashing it out with fists and feet. I think that would have been a lot more fun, Chris. Well, I, I, I for one, will never argue against dragons, so that is a very pun intended hot take. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I do see what you're saying. I see. I there. I think there was a lot of pots on the stove. If you, if you get what I'm saying, because yeah. I just, I just thought of this one, and I would have added it to my nitpicks. Um, I want, I wanted more background on the rings. Like we just start with, oh, he's got them. Like, where did they come from? And so I was I was I was happy to see that little bit uh, of a nugget in the mid credit scene or last credit scene. I can't keep track of which one, but I wanted to see like him finding them. It's a super quick scene, a little Indiana Jones. Give me that. But um, yeah, I thought it was I thought it was fine, uh, particularly the dragon of life or the lifesaver, whichever the white dragon is that's underwater, because that tied in directly to his mother. So like that one was fine. Um, And then. Third third acts are not Marvel's strong suit. That's you know been been widely you know fleshed out for for a good long time. But I I see what you're saying, and I I, I it was it was a little disappointing. So I was okay with the the one white dragon, but like the monstrous tentacled one. That one I feel like we could have like nipped that in the bud and still had that final confrontation with uh, between Shang Chi and and Wen Wu, and then like he sees it somehow without like this whole thing uh you know kind of right at the last second at the 11th hour kind of seeing the error of his ways without having you know it's 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 not very subtle you know having to see like all of the mess that he's unleashed uh, i wish we could have done it without that yeah i I think that's fair all right chris next dislike i think this might tie in with one of your dislikes as well but i needed more in a in a movie that's called shang chi uh, and the Legend of the Ten Rings. I needed more Shang Chi. It feels weird to say that. So maybe this is this is kind of chalked up to the too many pots thing. But like, didn't have a whole lot of Shang Chi. Like it was it was pretty fast paced. So I I needed a couple more scenes like showing his development. I just felt like he kind of got lost in the shuffle a little bit. And I would have liked to seen a little bit more, you know, development of him. Kind of scenes where, um, you know, like he's given. Um, the assignment from his father to assassinate his mother's killer kind of a little bit more into that and just trying to see his development, how he gets from point A to point B. How does he go from, uh, you know, his father's compound to San Francisco, like a little bit more in there. I would have liked to see. It's interesting too. And I hope I don't butcher somebody's name here again, but Simu Liu is a really affable guy with a great sense of humor from everything I've seen. And so, 
Shang-Chi is a little flat as a character, and I think it's because we don't have a whole lot of time to really get to know him. That's exactly right. I totally agree with you. So I think using some of that very natural charm that Liu has would have been um, extremely smart in this movie. It seems like a missed opportunity. Yeah, I'll... If you're a big Simu Liu fan, I highly recommend you go watch Kim's Convenience. It's this uh, Canadian program, I think, that um, is about this like Korean family uh, running a convenience store. Super funny. Yeah, I'll have to check that out because I, I think the guy just has a really, really cool personality in real life and just a great sense of humor. And I, I, Shang-Chi was just so humorless and flat. And I know there's big stakes and a lot of stuff going on. But, but you know, th- there is a, a certain amount of, of natural... Um, affability and charisma that this character uh, that this actor has that could have benefited the character i think yeah speaking of dinner scenes um the ones where they're like talking to their friends those were great as well and those were the ones where he really shined i think absolutely all right uh dave what is uh your next big dislike because i'm really interested to talk about this yeah my disappointment really is comes down to um shang chi's sister Ling. Uh, I think she's an incredibly undercooked character. They have the start of something with her, you know, with her abandonment issue, her anger towards Shang. That's that's really interesting. But then that train, that 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 whole uh, that whole idea, kind of gets abandoned a little bit once they get to you know Mystic Village and other dimension. And suddenly she you know sides with Shang. She's one of the good guys. Only oh wait, mid credit scene. You know, she's actually not dismantling the Ten Rings organization. She's taking it over. She's going to be the new, you know, leader of this organization. Like, that whole back and forth felt incredibly flat to me because it, she was so ill-defined. I, it is very difficult to wrap your head around her motivation, where she's coming from, why she decided to drop her anger towards Shang, then why she decided to go ahead and take over, you know, the Ten Rings organization. Like, the whole thing you don't really get the character. You don't really get enough into her head to understand why she's doing some of these things. So by the time this mid credit scene rolls around and see that she's not dismantling the organization, she's taking it over. It falls completely flat because you're like, uh, so why, why do I care? And why is she even doing that? And you know, is she going to use the 10 rings for good or evil? Like we don't even know. Uh, the whole thing is just, undercooked i think is the best way to put it chris yeah so so many plots and so many undercooked things i I think you know with so many moving parts it's just like one of those things you're like there they expect the audience to just kind of run with it and it is you know so i think it's similar to what we just said about shang chi i think a couple of scenes of her transitioning from teenager to young adult like okay like how did we get from point a to point b and i don't like when development takes place off screen or off panel in a comic so i needed more of that and hopefully i obviously with a tease like that they're not just going to let that character lie so i hope to see a lot more kind of backstory and development from her because it's it's particularly frustrating because i love the character so much so i wanted more and uh i i was left uh, you know in, in some ways it's good to be left wanting more but n- not too much yeah exactly and you know at least one thing we can probably count on is that any further development for this character is likely going to you know, happen on screen, either in a sequel or on Disney+. Plus. At the very least, they're not going to Star Wars us and tell us to buy a novel or comic book series to fill in the blanks. So um, we, a little patience, I guess, is what's required. All right, Chris, your final dislike of Shang-Chi. Okay, so... <clears throat> I, I I guess I should reframe this one as more of a nitpick because I love that they brought Trevor Slattery back for this. I thought it was a hilarious like inside joke, but I think it went on a little bit too long and they gave Sir Ben Kingsley. It's, it sounds crazy, but they gave Sir Ben Kingsley a little bit too much screen time. I think they leaned into it just a little bit. So um, I love like like I said before, the 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 kind of like biting commentary from the dinner scene of. You know, he named me after uh, a chicken dish, right? you know, so like that's just hilarious to me. But, you know, and then the the whole back and forth with what was his name? Nelson? Is it Nelson? The the little pig thing? I, I, I think so. I, I don't quite remember. But it, but that interaction was fun. Yeah, it was fun. I just think like it's if, if we could have 
you know, used a little bit of liposuction, take it from Trevor and give it to Shang or or to Sha Ling. I think that would have been a, a much better allocation of our time and, and, and screen time, I should say. Liposuction? Wouldn't a blood <laughs> transfusion be a, be a better metaphor here? I don't know. I'm 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 unexperienced in that area. Uh, okay, so cutting the fat a little bit. Okay, I yeah, get what you're saying. Go. Yeah, I agree uh, to a certain extent. I think Trevor coming back was fun. I think there was a lot of humor there. Uh, and I think it did go on a little <clears throat> too far. So uh, ultimately, uh, how it shook out is okay. But yeah, I think we could have probably cut a couple of minutes of, of Trevor uh, in favor of, of Shang by far. I can agree with that. And just let me say this here. I loved the Iron Man three reveal. I thought it was smart. And I also like, you know, maybe it's a little hindsight, but um, I think Kevin Feige has said that like, we weren't ready to tell that story at that time, you know? So like, rather than run the risk of rushing it and do like this, you know, falling into this racist trope or like not telling a very nuanced story, we kind of decided to do this. And, and again, maybe that's hindsight, but I love the whole trajectory of this. And I think it's much more nuanced and I think it's much more an, an intelligent approach than just, hey, uh, it's a big Iron Man villain. We don't know what we're doing. We're just going to throw him in there. Yeah, I can agree with that. Um, so, Dave, we kind of tossed this around a little bit, but what is your third and final dislike? And I know this is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of talking out of both sides of my mouth because I thought overall the Katie thing was fine because ultimately she's a supporting character. But when you look at the main character, Shang, we're getting uh, a very classic sort of superhero sci-fi fantasy trope, and that is the slacker becomes the hero. The loser becomes the hero. He's just a guy who parks cars. He's just a valet, but really... You know, he's the heir to this massive empire and he's a trained assassin and blah, de, blah, de, blah. And, you know, to a certain extent, seeing that trajectory, you know, and using that trope allows for growth in a character over a very short span, like two hours for a movie. He starts out as a nobody, but by the time the movie is over, the Avengers are hanging out with him. You know, I, I get that. It's shorthand. That's why the trope is so popular. But at the same time, uh, I think there would would have been other ways to do this kind of movie um we could have you know had him hiding out in a different way in a different situation he didn't have to you know hide out as this complete slacker parking cars or we could have done the movie completely from inside the 10 rings and you see him actually trying to run away and he keeps getting brought back by his father and ultimately he has to stand up to him you know you can still have the trevor stuff and and you know the angry sister because he keeps running away you didn't have to go he's hiding out in america as a valet that that main character slacker turned hero trope is getting a little tired in superhero media i think chris yeah, I can see that. And I think, you know, especially with such a, you know, an important shift and, a, the, you know, the resonance and, a, and, and the importance of what um, the character of Shang-Chi means to so many people, I think, uh, you know, could have been a little bit better served than that. Also, it's making me think of that Hades game that I uh, nerd commended a couple weeks ago where you're uh, Hades' son trying to escape the underworld. So <laughs> that you made me chuckle a little bit. <laughs> all right so what what final verdict do you have for shang chi chris man i really love this movie and you know i had a couple of nitpicks um that that weren't like overarching dislikes so um i, I would probably you know rename my dislikes as kind of more nitpicks um but i really love this movie and it instantly shot up you know recency bias of course but like i think the strength of wen wu the beautiful choreography the beautiful homages to things like crouching tiger um i think this really rang true for me so i'm gonna, i'm gonna go give this one a solid a yeah you know what i think i'll echo this it was a very very good time i had uh, a lot of fun watching this movie my wife really enjoyed it too and although you know the superhero stuff is not her absolute favorite i think she she got a lot out of this movie um it, it works in a lot of ways and even though there are you know a few things here and there that could have been better i think for what they were trying to accomplish with this movie i think to have a lot of lot to be proud of here all right, well, that is it for our uh, overview of Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. Uh, hit us up on social media. Let us know how you feel about the movie. After a quick break, we'll be back with the first installment of Nerd Nightmare. Yep, it's October. Let's get frightening. Oh, God. <laughs> Yeah. 
And we're back, and this time we don't have a nerd commendation. This time it's time for Nerd Nightmare. In this week's uh, Nerd Nightmare, we're going to be talking about The Exorcist. Now, for those of you who uh, weren't by word listeners last October, Nerd Nightmare is a segment where I, a uh, very seasoned fan of horror, introduce Chris. Torture. A little, scary, a little scaredy cat <laughs> to, to various classics in the genre. So, Chris, you've watched The Exorcist. Give it to me straight. How did you feel watching this one? Scared shitless. <laughs> good <laughs> God. Pun intended, good God. Um, wow. Like, I, lots of things. Uh, lots of things. Um, so I think, I'm trying to think, it's been 12 months. I think we. I just usually ramble with my instant reaction. Um, you know, medicine has come a long way from 1973. Uh, they're strapping this poor child with leather straps and drilling into her brain. Um, we've, we've done a lot better since then. Um, a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Just as Tad. Um, I mean, legitimately one of the most terrifying things that I have ever watched. And what I will say that like, this is like one of probably like artistically speaking, you know, I'm big humanities nerd, like artsy fartsy, um, you know, bleeding heart, whatever. This is legitimately one of the most well-made horror movies I've ever seen. I think it's very, like smart um i would not uh be surprised to find out that film twitter and their hoity toitiness would hold this film in high regard i think it's so well done i think one of the most terrifying things uh about this movie isn't even the scary stuff per se i think it's how quick the scenes are they just end a scene with no resolution and you're like Damn it, what just happened? Like, can we have some resolution, please? You're kind of leaving this hanging up in the air, and then that's not resolved, and we just jump. So I get whiplash going from one scene to another. Um, and just some really, like, I don't know how Linda Blair did that as a small child. Like, good heavens. So, yeah, it's just absolutely terrifying. Um, also, that deadbeat dad just missing out on all of this. Like, what the heck? Where he's just, like, sowing his wild oats in Europe. And his kids over here possessed by not just a demon, the whole devil. Okay. So um, just wild to me. And then um, I, I will say that the detective was pretty creepy, like uh, trying to get autographs. Um, he, he was a little bit weird. Um, this poor old man, the Father Marin, like this poor old man. Uh, and then legitimately traumatizing uh, the end of Father Karras. Like that whole thing, I felt so bad for that guy. Like is this, this, and, and, and it's a really interesting kind of, you know, this movie was not what I expected it to be. In some ways, yes, it was, of course, it's The Exorcist. So like, but like, I, I thought, I legitimately thought I was watching the wrong movie because we spent the first 10 minutes in Iraq and like this archaeological thing that never is really kind of followed up. Like there's just these like shadows, like, like in the background, like, did we unleash a spirit in Iraq? Like what's going on? That's just kind of hinted at, but like Father Karras's arc is legitimately depressing. And I feel so bad for this guy to the point where the devil says that thing about his mother's activities in the underworld uh, that I felt so bad for that guy. And I probably would have slit that child's throat right then and there. But um, yeah, so uh, legitimately traumatizing. And thank you. <laughs> You're very welcome, Chris. I, I work hard. I, I think, you know, The Exorcist obviously is, you are exactly right, uh, held in incredibly high regard by critics, by, you know, film Twitter, the hoity-toities, as you like to say. Uh, it is an incredibly well-crafted movie. And I think in a lot of ways, from an artistic perspective, uh, a lot of people consider it the gold standard of horror movies. On top of that, it's legitimately terrifying. As somebody who grew up uh, Catholic, uh, yeah, this one throws me for a loop to this day every time I watch it, uh, particularly the second half. But what I think really stands out about the movie um, is is how real the characters are. You know, this these are not um, 
quickly drawn tropey characters that we then can quickly dispatch like in a slasher movie you know Th- these are legitimate legitimately real people you know the the mother who's an actress but deals with a with a husband who is you know absentee uh, the daughter who struggles with you know that sort of sort of family situation the detective who does a decent job but at the same time is also a uh, a weirdo who wants autographs from people <laughs> that in the was weir- so in, weird. In the- he said, "I lied. It's for me." Like what? Yeah, and then you know, um, you know, Father Karras and all the stuff he's going through, and and his, you know, his his enjoyment of I think it's like boxing, if I remember right. Yes, yes. like like all of, all of this stuff, all of these characters feel real. They are not stereotypes or, or caricatures. They're not one dimensional. They're fully realized, and so then. When you put characters like that in horrific situations, I think that ups the terror. Um, when you take a very one-dimensional character and you have, you know, that character encounter Jason Voorhees in the forest, you know, it it might be thrilling, but it's not legitimately terrifying. But when real characters, real yeah, people who who resonate as true you know, encounter something, something horrific, then it makes you think, oh, crap, I could encounter something like this. And that just ups the terror that much more. It's really regrettable uh, that they tried several times to make sequels and prequels to this movie, and they never managed to recapture anything even close to that. Um, and I think horror in general, although it can be really good and really skilled, oftentimes completely fails to give their characters um, three dimensions. And, and that ultimately takes away from the terror. So although there are a lot of other very good horror movies, I think you're right. This one, from an artistic perspective, is probably one of the very best, Chris. Yeah, and I think you hit the nail on the head with the, the realism behind this and the unexplainable um, for for me. And I also think they did a genius job of laying out these characters like a before, a during, and an after, particularly with the character of Reagan. So like you see this fun-loving girl that has tickle fights with her mom and they're, they're doing jokes and stuff like that. And then you see this marked change. And then you see the after effects and like the trauma, the bruises on her face and the scars that are left. Like it's it's just uh, that's part of the the buildup of the horror, you know. Like with none of those movies last year, I'm I'm gonna you know be honest. Like none of those movies legitimately terrified me to this level, and I think you nailed it. Is exactly why you know, um, you know, my dad's side of the family was Catholic as well, so I'm very familiar with with all of it. I went to mass once, and that was all I could take. That was three or four hours. I'll never get back. I'm sorry, um, <laughs> but. <laughs> But so, but like, just like the, I'm trying to think because, you know, being a Spanish teacher, I've, you know, I've been directly intertwined with the Catholic faith as well as, as a large number of, you know, Spanish speaking, you know, uh, countries are, are overwhelmingly Catholic as well. So um, just like the iconography, I guess, of, of the Catholic religion and just like, there's always this mystique that has always kind of clouded it for me. It's always fascinated me. I've researched Catholicism, you know, from an outsider's perspective and, you know, you add something like this. So even from the outside, like I was like researching like exorcism, like I was too scared to watch the movie, but I was like reading Wikipedia pages about it um, and and stuff like that. And then um, it's just so relatable, but like, you know, think back to the movies that we watched um, last year. There, there's none of this realism to it. Um, you know, with with Nightmare on Elm Street, that's just like a weird ten year old's fever dream. Like, okay, so this guy's got a big claw hand. Like, that seems silly. That wasn't really terrifying to me. Um, it was a little bit over the top, and so like that kind of dumbed down the scariness for me. Um, the haunting that was just a joke, and like, yeah. like the CGI is <laughs> so bad, so yeah. bad. These little children hidden in the wood, they look like they're just swimming in chocolate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then um you know um oh uh night of the living dead i was just so angry about ben being killed at the end so like i identified with that character everybody else was a flipping idiot that i was just like too pressed rooting for ben for him to ultimately be killed to be scared like that wasn't scary and they were slow moving also michael myers not very scary to me because I mean, I know what's going to happen because he has his own freaking entrance music when he walks in a room. So, oh, it kind of is kind of anticlimactic. Also, he's very slow moving. If you don't throw a box under that dude's legs and trip him, like, come on. 
<laughs> but you know in contrast the exorcist this is very realistic like i could have also as a parent like i identified so much with ellen burston's character like this is legitimately terrifying like, oh my god that could have been one of my kids you know like what would happen if that were to be one of my kids what would i do in this situation yeah exactly yeah it's one of my all-time favorite movies and although i don't revisit it as often as some uh, for obvious reasons uh it is always fantastic to revisit it yeah. Also, also screw you for sending me that gif. Um, you know, in reply on Twitter when I was running away from the movie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're very. You like? I'm like a. I feel like a, a moth trapped in a glass with this experience. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe next week's Nerd Nightmare won't be quite as terrifying, Chris. Maybe. Oh God, I don't even know what did what did we pick. Oh, I'm gonna have to revisit the list myself at this point. <laughs> all righty folks well that's it for another episode of the nerd by word podcast thank you so much for joining us for another episode if you like what you heard please give us a rating and review on your favorite podcasting platform and subscribe so you never miss an episode we release episodes every monday and we are available wherever you can find your podcasts including our very own website nerdbyword.com and as always, hit us up on social media, on Twitter and Instagram, at NerdByWord, uh, or individually at that nerd Dave and that nerd Chris. Be sure to check out our sibling podcast, X of Words, uh, for some merry mutant madness. And as always, stay well and stay nerdy. The Nerd By Word is written and produced by Chris and Dave, two nerds with a love of all things pop culture. The podcast features music by Al Jimenez with additional drops composed by Joe Biondi. Our show art is by Ashery Design. Find us at nerdbyword.com and wherever podcasts are available. Mm-hmm.